Good afternoon, everybody. I know it's a packed session, so thank you for squidging in. Uh, my name is Kathleen Saxton. I'm the chairman of the advisory board for Advertising Week Europe, and it gives me great pleasure to welcome you here this afternoon. As you know, we have a very strong agenda in all three rooms throughout the rest of today and the rest of this week. And when we curated this session, we always knew it would be something incredibly special. I hope Sir Martin won't mind me saying that when we first put the request in for his appearance and we asked John Lenson what we could do, in an ideal world we wanted something different. And whilst bath shaped recessions proved to be right and grey swans are all the rage, I wanted to see if Sir Martin personally could be passionate about other things including winning. He agreed winning was probably somewhere in the mix and we agreed it was high time that maybe Sir Martin asked some questions rather than always had to answer them. So Martin kindly offered to swap seats and here we are today with another sir, Dave Brailsford, who knows a thing or two about winning and he has happily also agreed to get involved, so thank you. So here we are, two sirs, two legends, two winners. Thank you both and we are honoured to have you here. Sir Martin, over to you. Even abroad. <laughs> okay, so they usually start this off by saying the, the guest needs no introduction he, and I'm going to live by that he does need no introduction so the first question <coughs> is can I call you Dave or David or it's Sir a, David it's a, no it's definitely a Dave a Dave all right okay Dave so can you give us a little bit of background to you the person I mean there's a fair bit in the material that all of us can uh, google or bing about you um, but can you say a little bit about the because I think one of the most interesting things is why you got where you are mm. and where you will be and what made you such a winner? Well I, um, I, I grew up, I was born in Derby um, at the age of two, my dad's a mountaineer, um, he's a nice climber, he's a, he's a guide, he was a guide for most of his career in, uh, in the Alps and at the age of two uh, we were living like I say down in Derby and he decided to move the whole family down to North Wales which at the time was the mecca for the rock climbers, uh, the Clamberis Pass and Snowdonia and so um, I grew up there and I grew up in a in a slate mining uh, village um, and my first language was Welsh so until I was 16 years old all my, all my school lessons all So my you friends. were very pleased what happened on Saturday oh, when, we, when, we let, no, no. when we let the Welsh win It was a tough one oh, Yeah, yeah. No, no, I, was, I, was, I was thrilled yeah. okay. and um, I think it could be in, in many respects because I know how much it means to the Welsh as against I think the English beat, beat the Welsh one thing but for the Welsh to beat the English it does mean so much more in Why, my, were, they, why in were the mind. English so pathetic? Um, I don't think they were pathetic as such, but I think um, I wouldn't say that the English were pathetic. I think the, that the Welsh were better. The Welsh beat the English. The English didn't lose to the Welsh, if you know what I mean. Would be my take on it. Okay, but I, <laughs> okay, I took you away from your from your early beginnings. Yeah, so, so I, I, I kind of grew up first language Welsh um, in a small small little um, village um, in Snowdonia, and um, the one thing that I had, uh, one of the challenges I think I had growing up was that my parents were uh, both English. And I was in a very, very Welsh um, uh, society. Um, and they were pretty anti-English, to be honest. A lot of hol holiday home burning going on at the time. And, so um, you became chippy? Yeah, no, I think so. I, think I, to, I thought I had to prove myself more than uh, maybe some of, some of my mates. I just wanted to be like everybody else. And I wanted my parents to be like everybody else. I didn't want them to be going around with, uh, you know, climbing. And, and, and my dad was a keen cyclist. And at the time, he used to turn up in Lycra. And I was horrified, <laughs> horrified. And to the point where I used to say to him on a regular basis, look, if you're out on your bike and I'm with my mates and you ride past, if you wave, you can wave if you want, but you're not getting, I'm not even going to recognise you, you know. <laughs> Don't even do it to me. But um, so I grew up in, in that Was kind your mum a dominant woman? Uh, no, no, my dad was the, yeah, yeah. He, he was, he, the... he was um, very, very, he was an orphan. Um, he was orphaned when he was, uh, uh, he lost his mum when he was five, his dad when he was seven. And he grew up with a very strong work ethic and very, very determined guy. And it's all about, you know, making your own way in life. I think he had some pretty uh, tough experiences. He was fostered and um, the foster family yet together in, in one room and they made him eat on his own in another room, which I can't imagine psychologically. <laughs> well, well, I do know what he did to him because I haven't seen him over the years. But I think it gave him such a, a determined, self-driven right. um, streak, if you like. That, right. that, that, some, of, some of that rubbed off on us. And did you have brothers and sisters? Yeah, I've got a younger brother and um, an elder sister. Um, my younger brothers are very, very... Uh, my dad took us climbing, of course, um, but I was terrified of heights, which, um, which, I, which was quite difficult because he wanted us, you know, off we went climbing, he'd be dragging us up a frozen waterfall and... I think, oh God, I can't believe I'm here. I hate this. And I had the courage up to tell him I was absolutely petrified. And he was just like, oh, it's no problem. And he just pulled the rope up. And I just kind of got 
<laughs> up the frozen waterfall to the top, and that was great, you know. But my brother was a very, very good climber. And at, um, there's a thing called Cenotaph Corner in Tamberis Pass, where it's a massive, massive chunk of rock, very, very high up on, in the valley. And um, it's got a, a, you know, a, a route that goes right up the corner, the crack of the book, if you like. It looked like a book. And he came home uh, one day. He's younger than I am. He's 14 years old. And we were sitting around a dinner table, and he said, uh, yep, so I uh, free climbed Cenotaph Corner today. So we've been up without a rope. The youngest person ever to climb this. And it's massive. It's horrific. I couldn't even get to the bottom. I was too scared. How old was he at the time? 14. 14. Yeah. Jesus. And of course, my mum went absolutely crazy. My dad was, yes. <laughs> <laughs> and was there so, anything about being the middle kid? Does that? Funnily enough, I mean, um, I'm sure we'll talk about Steve Peters, who's a psychiatrist who... Um, who's worked very closely with me and I've learned so, so much from. Um, the very first time I met him, we were chatting away and he said, so tell me about your brother and sister. And I was like, well, how do you know I've got a brother and sister? He said, look, I know you've got a brother and sister. <laughs> you are definitely a middle child, which is quite impressive. What did he mean by that? I think there's certainly, um, he believes anyway, and I, th and I can sort of relate to it, that um, there are different, you know, as the first child, there's... You know, it's a very st stereotypical thing to say, but as the first child, you know, the, all the excitement of being the first child and everything else, the second child comes along, and then the, there's the baby of the family, and there was seven years between myself and my, uh, my younger brother, and my parents, everything that had gone wrong with me and my sister, they absolutely tried to get right with my younger brother, and they adored my younger brother. They absolutely adored him, and I just felt stuck in the middle, and I felt I was neither... You know, Fish nor fell. Yeah, exactly, exactly. And I think that that creates an angst. And I think um, so. You got angst at school because all these Welsh people yeah. were beating you up at school. Yeah. And then you were angst at home. And yeah, this was a so. yeah, yeah, was, was a driver. Was, yeah. I think that's, that's that's fair to say. Yeah. Okay. And then um, um, all I wanted, I hated school. I absolutely hated. But school. then you did all these degrees. I mean, you you you're a civil engineer. Yeah, there's a difference. Sports. I think between being able to be do education and learn and actually enjoy and gain structured kind of environment which maybe wasn't necessary for, at the time. So I, I left school when I was 16. Um, I started off as a civil engineer. Um, so I did an ONC and an HNC. And so the day I got my qualification was the day I packed my bike and said, right, I'm off. I'm going. I'm going to France to live. Put my bike in a box, rucksack, and um, off I went with my £800 savings to go and win the Tour de France. And um, again, my mum was horrified, and my dad was like, yes, come on, <laughs> <laughs> off you go. You know, go and get your... So I got the train down to Grenoble, got a single ticket to Grenoble. How did you get f fascinated by cycling? Because your father's alpine guide. He's an alpine guide, yeah. No, yeah. well, it, it started off, I got... Um, I, was, I was a very, very keen footballer. Um, football was the game that all of, we all played. Football and cricket, basically. And um, I got quite a nasty injury, tore, tore the ligaments, ligaments in my knee, and the, uh, the local doc and physio... Uh, recommended that I started riding my bike as rehab. This is again when you were. What? I was about I was about 16, 15, 16 at the time. So I started riding my bike, and then my dad was going out on his bike. So I said, actually, you know what? Come on, then let's go out together. And I actually realised he was actually pretty good at this bike riding thing. And so I thought, yeah, I could learn something here. So um, so we actually started going cycling together. And um, from from quite a troubled childhood, I wouldn't say we were very close. We had a period of maybe from when I was 16, through, right through my 20s, where we cycled regularly together. And that became the thing that really pulled us together, which was, um, which was great to find. But it was a complete, a complete accident, I must say. You know? So we, I went from there to really getting into it. Decided I didn't, didn't, wasn't so keen on team sports, because you could be great and the team would lose, or you could be rubbish and the team win. Mm. I actually preferred, I thought, actually, I'd try and find a sport where... You were born, you were born in 64. 64, yeah. And where was Tommy Simpson at that time? I, he'd have been, where would he have been? He'd have been riding and racing. So he was a, an idol or a... No, not really, no. I was too, at that time, you know, I wasn't really into... I found the sport and I loved the sport. I didn't necessarily love the professional right. racing side of the sport. I loved, I loved the sport for what it re represented to me at the time. Right. And it was only once I started, you know, obviously, I, I, I was keen on what was going on. I watched what was going on. Um, but it wasn't really until I left and went to, to France and tried to establish my own racing career there. You went to Grenoble, was it? Yeah. Went to Grenoble to start with and then uh, didn't know what I was doing, didn't think it would be a problem, didn't think language would be a problem and kind of... Well, French-Welsh. Yeah. Extremely <laughs> well, good. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Welsh is way closer to French <laughs> than English is, which is a good thing. Um, but, uh, but, you know, I got there and um, I didn't know how to find a team, so I looked, got to the end of a professional bike race and basically looked for the nicest kit. 
and just went up to them with my bike in a box rucks. I was very naive. I nice is lycra. You yeah, got exactly. And, and I just asked whether I could join them, and they sort of fell around laughing. <laughs> and um, they sort of another, recommended another guy, and they recommended another guy, and eventually this guy came along. I think he took pity on me. And he said, look, if you turn up, we all train together on a Wednesday. It said Tetien. Come over to St. Etienne, you can train with us. And I th off they went, and I thought that was, they thought that was the last time they were going to see me. But sure enough, <laughs> I went to St. Etienne to this address and waited for them, and they were like, what the hell are you doing here? You know? <laughs> and that was it. I raced for them for three years. So I stayed with that team for three and years. And with any degree of success? I was okay. I mean, I could, I, could, I could make a living out of it just about. They gave me a flat, and I got minimum wage. Um, and, you know, obviously, it, the, the bonuses for winning, et cetera, et cetera, and the team won bonuses. Although it took me about four or five months before I could speak enough French to realise that there was actually bonuses, because all the guys who were taking the money and split it, <laughs> they, they weren't giving me any, that was for sure. Um, but, but it was a great experience, you know, and I think more than anything else, um, the, the, the real takeaway for me was, I, I loved it, I absolutely loved doing it. I recognised I was never going to be good enough, um, but I loved reading as much as, I, all of a sudden I found a passion, and yeah. my passion was, how do you, you know, how do you get fit for sports? And how do you, what, is it, what does it take to win at sport? So I'd read everything that I could read about, you know, conditioning and, and physical, sort of the physical training from that side early, of it. From the age of 16, 17. Oh, I, I absolutely. Well, I was about 18, but I, I couldn't get enough, you know. And then, um, and then I, I thought about the psychology of it. And, of course, being alone, there's no mobile phones. I didn't have a telephone or anything else. So I lived alone. Um, couldn't speak the language quite a long time, obviously. So I lived alone in France and, and you know, just grinded it out. And I didn't, didn't, couldn't say that was necessarily an enjoyable thing. I, the, from a cultural point of view, I think I, I really found out how to operate in a different culture. So there's a third cetera, element of being a loner here, this was sort of family a little bit, yeah, maybe. school a little bit, and then this little bit. Yeah, possibly, yeah. yeah okay. I, I wouldn't say that. Too. And then when you were 19, what happened then? What about the, all this education that you had? You are an MBA, yeah. God help so, us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, I, after three years racing, yeah. I realised I, I wasn't actually going to make it. So I thought, you know what, I, I really enjoy this whole coaching sports science thing. So I'll go to university. And I learned that, so I went, went off to university. That was at Chester, was at it? At Chester, yeah. yeah. So I did a, a Liverpool University degree at Chester. And um, I was just a dream student, because I came in, you know, I wasn't interested in the party and stuff, wasn't interested in all the social... You were boring, you were. I was terribly boring, yeah. But boy, I wanted, to, at that point, after, after all those years at school, I found, uh, I wanted to learn. What you wanted, yeah. Oh, God, yeah, and I, could, I just, I, the lecture, I pestered them all the time, they, you know, I think that, that was just a pain in the arse. So this is the, where the passion came from? Yeah, 100%, yeah, absolutely, and, and I just read and read and read and read, and, and, and I just kind of, you know, tried to figure it all out, and sort of once I, once I realised the sort of, I, I'm very, I think one of the great things was once I realised what scientific rigour was, in terms of imp uh, continuous improvements and how do you apply the methods of science to trying to get imp improvements in, in all walks of life and having an hypothesis. But you cetera, never lost the balance, did you? I mean, in the same way as we talk now about our industry being an art and the science, you know, maths men and mad men is, I think, the best way of putting it. You, you've always been in, interested in that balance, mm. the passion, the importance well, I, of... Well, I, I think that, that any data or knowledge or everything else gives you a context and it paints a sort of canvas, if you like. But the difference, that's where the art side of coaching particularly yeah. comes in, is what you, you, you can't coach by numbers. You know, you're dealing with human beings and every human being is different. You know, we're not ants. And, um, and therein lies the, 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 the trick, really. Is that here's, here's a bunch of data that will tell you a story and paint a picture, but can you recognise that picture and then take that and simplify it and put it into everyday life? And I think a lot of, you know, you, you tend, in coaching, you tend to get the people who are, let's say, ex-players, the people who, um, who will be described as they're brilliant people, uh, people, people. They understand people, they really get it, and they can motivate people, and they're down that, that end of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. At the other end, you get all these sports scientists who are just Buffins, real numbers, Buffins, yeah. and it's all about the numbers, and everything's about the numbers. And of course, uh, they don't know much about people, it tends to be. And so they, neither of them get really far, and what you're, the, the, the holy grail is somewhere in the middle. So Moneyball and Billy Beam, was it the Oakland Athletics yeah. would be pretty much, you'd agree with that? Yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm meeting Billy Bean again in, we're, we're getting together in April and... Because um, you hang out with all these sports scientists, uh, don't you? These I wouldn't say we hang out. I you, I don't you have uh, an annual, an annual, an <laughs> annual thing? hang around, sir, I don't No, no, think, no, no, no. I, mean, I mean you get together with them every year. Yeah, we year, do, so. yeah. Yeah, and, and um, I think the one thing that, um, that stayed with me right from those early days when I realised that I wanted to learn about something is that I still want to learn about it. And I think, you know, 
you then start looking at other people and different approaches, and you're thinking, right, where, where's the next, wh where's the next bit of learning? Where's the next idea going to come from? Right. He's constantly having a, you know, a drive and a quest. And I'd, I'd say that the the step changes that have happened to cycling in this country, or certainly with, within my teams, if mm. you like, the step changes in performance have, have, have tend to come, or tended to come from people from outside of the sport. So uh, Steve Peters would be one who's a psychiatrist, nothing to do with sport. Um, when I met him, that was a he real... He was a general psychiatrist, sort of... Uh... He was, um, he's a forensic psychiatrist. So as against a psychologist, psychologist, master's degree, mm -hmm. you can start practicing psychology. Um, psychiatrist uh, have to go through uh, the medical, right. seven years of medical training, right. and then they specialise in psychiatry. And then you choose a certain thing, and he chose forensic psychiatry. So he was actually working at, um, at Rampton with uh, mass murderers and psychopaths when I, when I first met him. And he's fitted beautifully into sports. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> How did you meet him as a matter of interest? Um, what happened was at the Commonwealth Games in Manchester in 2002, I, had a, I got a phone call and from one of the coaches who said that um, one of our riders was in the corner of a room and been in a corner of a room for, for a whole day and most of the night and they hadn't, they hadn't uh, ate, they hadn't drunk anything and of course they hadn't slept, they weren't saying anything. And it was like, you know, Dave, what are we going to do? You know, and my answer was, well, he's sectioned him, I suppose, and you know, I don't know. And, and I didn't know, and it was really worrying to, to feel, we, we felt out of our depth. And uh, a, a friend of mine who was a doctor, uh, was a, uh, went to university and was a pupil of Steve's, and he recommended him, so I gave him a ring, and he said he'd pop over to Penn, he lives in Sheffield, he, he'd pop over to Manchester. And he came and saw uh, this individual, and three weeks later, this individual won a medal at the Commonwealth Games in Manchester, which was just, it was, it was so far removed in terms of what we thought was possible at the time, that I really had to sit down with this guy and say, what the hell did you do there? You know, how did that work? And for the first time, I studied sports psychology and sports science. And sports psychology always felt a little bit woolly, you know, it's a bit like, um, you know, the, think, you know, think of, a, think of a, a time, you know, it's like visualization and this yeah. kind of stuff. It's all well and good, but actually it wasn't, it wasn't, it wasn't hard hitting enough for, for me. It didn't, um, it, it wasn't practical enough, you know. And, um, Steve was the first time that I ever met anybody who basically described the brain um, insofar as it's a machine. And his, his theory, uh, which, is, which, which has underpinned pretty much everything that I've done in the last 10 years now, um, was based on the idea that um, very much like we're, we're, we're all comfortable with the idea that in the torso, they're all the vital organs. So you've got your liver, your lungs, your kidneys, etc., all doing various different jobs, but actually all fitting together to keep us alive. And, and his analogy is that in the brain, there are the, all these various bits of the brain working in different ways. And if you understand which bit of the brain is working at what time, it will then, you will then understand uh, human behavior and certainly how people are thinking. And, um, and, and I was very intrigued by that because then it started to, to, to a certain point, be able to give some clear ideas to, well, if this is happening, what would you do? How do you, how do you change it? Right. So his basic, uh, do you want me to explain it? Yes, good. Bit? Yeah. So, um, the model is called, he calls it the chimp model, uh, Steve. And basically what he says is that um, there are all these different parts of, of the brain, but in, in, in this particular model there are three important bits. And one's the limbic system, which is at the, um, at the foot of the, the stem of the brain. Um, and it's a very prehistoric, it's been there for, for ages, it's for millions and millions of years to develop, and very much like the, it's, it's, it, what, all of us have a, a, a different, um, part of, of, of the limbic system, which is individual and, and, and very distinct to yourselves, very much like the colour of our eyes, the colour of our hair, etc., you know, or whether we've got any hair even. Um, and, you know, you can't change it. And this is our emotional centre. It doesn't do anything else except for offer emotion. Um, so it's a fight, uh, flight freezes in there. Um, so this area he calls the chimp. And the frontal lobe, that's where there's the, the theory of mind, logic, that's where we have consequences, we think of consequences, um, and all of the logical side of our thinking exists. And that's where the human is. So in, in Steve's model, there's, there's two of us. There's you, which is in the frontal lobe, which is you, the person, and then there's your chimp, which is your emotional center. Um, and, and depending where the blood flow goes, it's whether you're thinking or your chimp's thinking. And, um, I'm just thinking, what am I thinking now? Well, <laughs> I'll, I'll, give you, I'll try, and, try and put it into some kind of context. So, um, in, 
in sporting terms, um, you know, if, if, if we get threatened, the emotion, the chimp will go, right, I don't want to be threatened, I'm going to either fight, I'm going to run away, or I'm, I'm going to take ourselves out of this situation. So in sporting terms, um, when people are getting ready to compete, it doesn't matter if it's a, a Chris Hoy or a Bradley Wiggins, it doesn't matter who it is, there's always a, an element where the chimp's going, are we sure we're all right for this? Are we ready for this? Is everything okay? Are we going to get in trouble? What am I going to look like in front of all these people? What happens if I win? What happens if I lose? I'm getting really worried about this now because I've just checked out his legs over there and they look way more muscly than the last time I've seen him. <laughs> and this is typical kind of chimp, your chimp agitating and worrying you. And if you allow this to take over and get hijacked by it, then you're in real big trouble. And of course, at the same time, there's a dialogue where you, the person, the, the logical side of the brain is going, well, actually, we've trained for this, so we should be OK. We've been here many, many times before. Come on, you know, we're going to be all right here. We're actually quite good at this because everything that we've done in the past, we know, it's not just going to disappear overnight. So there's this kind of constant uh, But did you dialogue. say there were three parts of the brain? There are three parts. Yeah. And the th uh, let me, well, just quickly, a good example of the chimp and chimp behaviour would be this. We've all had emails <coughs> when you've received an email and you think, oh, I can't believe, I cannot believe what I've just read. <laughs> And Frequ off you go. <laughs> off you go. Every day, every day. Steam coming <laughs> off the TK, you know, and, and you're know, right, I'll tell you, you know, and I'm boom, off you go. Whew, I feel better. 20 minutes later, you've got, I can't believe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I cannot believe I sent that. What was I thinking? And of course, in, in this model, you didn't send the email, your chimp did. And, um, so and next, time, next time I fire something off, I can say it wasn't me, it was my chimp. Well, well you can, and, and we use this, uh, you know, so, so for, to, to, yes, you can. <laughs> However, um, uh, it's not an excuse for bad behaviour. So some people have got very violent, everybody's chimp's different, and some people have got very violent chimps, some people have got very aggressive chimps, some people have got passive-aggressive chimps, and, and it's used in, particularly you see it in, in, in bullying or how people react, and certainly in sport with aggression and some crazy behaviours, because... It's an emotional reaction, so there's no consideration of consequence. So you can always, you know, so you can see these really outlandish behaviours, but it's no excuse to say, well, that's, that was just my chimp. You know, if you're bullying somebody or your, uh, your behaviour is so bad, it's like having a Rottweiler. You know, it's not saying, I took my Rottweiler off the lead and he went and bit somebody, but that's what Rottweilers are trained to do. It's a Rottweiler, you know, it's an excuse. It's not an excuse, keep your Rottweiler on the lead. You know, and, and I think that's very important. But what we use it for... So the third, oh, just one bit, the third bit of the brain is like an empty computer, if you like, called the parietal lobe, and that's where we learn and store all, all, all automatic uh, behaviours, and, and we store information, and they become automatic. A good example of that would be driving a car. We've all been in a car for the first time, ready to drive, and it's like, how the hell am I going to... I can't, there's no way that I'm going to be able to do all of this. And six months later, later, you're driving along, you've got Starbucks in one hand, you're texting on the other one, and yet you're still <laughs> driving a car, you know. Well, you're not driving a car. Your parietal lobe is driving a car quite happily for you. Um, and, and that's where this, uh, these automatic responses come in. And for us, uh, in sport in particular, people talk about the zone. For us, it's where you, you can switch off the chimp uh, and the emotional engagement. You switch off the frontal lobe so you're not thinking it through and you just allow the parietal lobe to automatically do what you've practised and can do uh, very, very, to a very, very high level. But penalty kicks being the obvious the obvious. And the great, the great instance of the penalty kick, of course, is, is, uh, was Jamie Carragher, who, um, back in the last, not last European champion, it could have been last, when, when Sven Goran Eriksson yeah. was in charge, yeah. it came to the last game against, I think it was against Spain, they practiced penalty taking um, in training, and it turned out that Jamie Carragher was the highest uh, percentage uh, success rate in penalties. Now, he doesn't take penalties for Liverpool, um, but sure enough, it was in extra time, there's three minutes to go to game, and they brought Jamie Carragher on as a substitute so he could take his penalty. And he went up, he went to penalties, he put a, put a ball down, ran up, he's, and he scored a beautiful penalty, bottom right-hand corner, and it goes. And as he's walking away, the referee blows his whistle, for those of you who remember, blows his whistle, and he turns around, what's wrong? And he said, well, I hadn't blown my whistle to tell you to take the penalty. And, of course, in practice, they hadn't used a whistle in practice when they were training. He'd never taken a, a, a penalty in open play for, for Liverpool, um, and so he just run up and kicked the ball before the refs whistled. He had to take it again. And at that moment, his chimp has got, just got a grip of him and go, oh, my God, you look like a bird, you know. And, and he just literally, the, the chimp then gets hold of you, and that's where then he went, walked down, 
he, he just lost it, put the ball down, and he just gently kicked the ball into the goalkeeper's arm. So if you've been the coach, you've been Sven, what would you have said? I don't think there's anything you can do at that point. It's too late. Just too gone. The, the, the thing about understanding the, 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 which bits of the brain are working, I think, is to understand, to recognise it in yourself first. Um, so in terms of us, in terms of decision-making, in, um, in terms of how we interact with one another, uh, it's understanding if, if, if everybody's, you know, you can't, you can't just say, well, I'm not going to have any chimp behaviour anymore. You're like, that's yeah. this part of the brain thing. So if I'm annoyed because I feel that you've done something to me, and I come to you and said, right, and, and this is the type of thing you'll hear at British Cycling. You go, right, my chimp is right out. <laughs> <laughs> you have really pissed me off here. So, so and, then and, and for me, then my responsibility within our, within our team, if I know that there's not a lot you can do about that at that point in time. So I said, okay, okay, fair enough. And my job is not allowed just immediately to allow my chimp to go, come on then, let's have an argument. You know, so then you've got two chimps talking to it. It's a disaster, you know, the, the, and the person who's still in human mode, as it were, has to recognise what's going on and said, OK, look, let's get it off your chest, what's the matter? And you try and get the other person to start moaning and groaning and going, and you can only moan for about six or seven minutes before so you actually... So next time a creative director loses his marbles or her marbles, you we just, just go, say... chimp. Chimp, OK, fine. <laughs> All Recognise what's going on. It's All not going to last for long, and then come back and when the person... So in, in, in critical situations, let's say the Olympics or, you know, key bits of races, if one of our coaches or myself, anybody else, starts to get to that point where we think, actually, OK, I'm, my chimp's running this show here now, then I'm taken out as decision making because okay. it's irrational. Now, just go jumping back, you did your Chester course with three or four years or whatever it is, then you did an MBA in Sheffield, mm. right? So why that? What, what was the...? Uh, well, I got, got, I got that, my first degree and then started working in, um, in, in sport and, it, and I just thought actually I'm, I'm not really aware of things like um, accounting and marketing and so all these other the areas of, of, um, of, of knowledge that I, I just thought at the time of just... I couldn't see where sports psychology was going at the time as a, as a, as a profession. Um, so I decided to do that, uh, which I really enjoyed again. Um, and that gave me a, a, a greater breadth of understanding, if you like, and, and possibly then if I thought, well, it might go and work in business, it may, may have given me an avenue to go and work in business. So it was all about balance again, mm. between not just science and arts, but also passion and business, yeah. the two together. Okay, <coughs> so that was, I, I found that interesting anyway. So we've got, a, we've got We've got another 22 minutes left, so I want to open up for questions. But just, so please get your questions ready, and we've got a couple of mics here. But let me just take you back to post-Beijing. I mean, you had a stunningly successful Beijing Olympics. Seven out of ten, one road race as well, which was uh, seven, seven out of ten of the track goals. Mm. So eight in, eight in total. Uh, and I remember we asked you to come to a WPP new business meeting. And uh, you came in, and I always remember it because you... The meticulous planning that you had, you know, so much so that the advance guard, if the team was staying at a hotel, somebody would go and polish the knobs of the doors with disinfectant, disinfectant to make sure there were no germs and nobody caught colds. And I thought, my God, that was, that was amazing, your attention to detail. But you said at that meeting that you were going to win the Tour de France. Now, we all, we all listened to that and thought, high probability of you achieving that, but you achieved it faster than you indicated you would do both at that meeting and then subsequently, I think you said, it'll take you five years and it took you two years or whatever it is, or it took the team two, two, two years or Bradley Wiggins two years. What, what was the plan? When you were at the, that new business meeting, how would you articulate the strategy and the execution? Or did you have a firm plan or was it just a big hairy goal that you threw out there? Well, to, to a certain extent, it was, <coughs> a, it was a very ambitious goal. But on the other hand, whenever we do anything, we, uh, I think one of the cornerstones of, um, of our approach is that we're very outcome focused and unless we truly understand the outcome before we get going we won't we won't start and and quite often i think we find people who will start on a project or start with a strategy etc without really really understanding the exact detail of what success looks like so we always start by analyzing the demands of the event and when i say analyzing it i mean truly truly understanding the the demands of the event so if it's i don't know chris hoy in the sprint or if it's winning the tour de france we spend hours and hours and hours thinking and doing our homework about what power to weight will it take, you know, what, what kind of average speed will it take, what power does it take to do that, what aerodynamic drag and drag coefficient does a rider need to, re to go X, you know, kilometres an hour, what's the nutritional strategy look like, and just we, we, we analyse this thing to the nth degree until we've got a plan, 
And only then, and, uh, and only then, will we go back and say, right, let's have a look where we're at now and do a gap analysis. And once we've done the gap analysis, then we'll start thinking about how, whether it's feasible or not, and then genuinely thinking about how we're going to actually bridge that gap. And, uh, and with the Tour de France, we, we did our homework and then we had a look at the, the, the where we were at, and particularly with Bradley, and we actually thought, actually, you know what, this is, this is doable. This is very doable, actually, if we get it right. And so um, that's why at the time I think we felt fairly confident. And what was the gap? I mean, you said you did a gap. <laughs> so it's, it's a significant gap at the time, and there was gaps. Not, it was not just a, a physical thing uh, in, in Bradley's, uh, for, uh, with, with regards to Bradley, but there was, as a new team, we'd never, none of us had ever won the Tour de France. We didn't really know from an experienced point of view what that would take. There was, an, uh, you know, there was a tactical thing, there was the logistics, there was getting the right equipment, there was getting the nutritional strategy. There's a whole myriad of things that we felt contributed towards getting, you know, winning the Tour de France. Bradley had never w ridden the yellow jersey, and when you win in the Tour de France, you, you, you become the leader of a race. You have to go afterwards. Instead of going home on some next hotel with the rest of the team in a bus, you stay behind, you've got to do your dope control, and then you've got to do a press conference, and that'll take a, you know, an extra hour and a half. You, don't, you, you can't necessarily eat and start your recovery process for racing the next day. So there are all these little bits that we thought, actually, we've got, to, we've got to get into the swing of this, because mm. if you just rock up on the first time and try and do it the first time, it's not, it's not going to work. So um, I think we, this outcome uh, focus strategy that we, we work to is very, very important. And I think then the second thing, from a human perspective, although we deal in, you know, we're trying to win gold medals at the Olympics, or we're trying to win a race, so it's all results-based, and we differentiate totally between um, dreams and targets. So we'll say, and this is, this is to do with the chimp again. So what we'll say is, um, if, um, let's say it's, it's Chris Hoy and, and trying to win a gold medal at the Olympics, the last Olympics. Chris's dream, and all of our dreams, was support him uh, to try and win the, the gold medal. But it was a dream after all. And we don't know whether somebody was going to come along and be faster than Chris. We just don't know that. So that dream was, to a large extent, out of our control. So what we then do is work on targets, analyze the demands of the events, and work on targets that are within our control. And we completely focus on those targets then. And we recognize that the dream is something that might happen, but it might not. But we know that if you just focus on the goal is winning the, the, the Olympic Games, the chimp starts to go, I'm not sure I can do this. I'm worried about my opposition. And there's a constant agitation all the time. Uh, the riders, they'll agitate all the time because they're worried. And they're you know, constantly having this dialogue with themselves about they're gonna, whether they're going to achieve it or not. So we, we, we make targets of what the power, he, you know, what gym weights does he have to get, what body, um, you know. And these can be very small increments, can't they? Very, very small increments, you know. <coughs> and so we make it all under control. But the biggest of all, and it's a very simple thing, but the way to, to really get on the start line and your chimp is calm and it's not going to ruin your performance is, is to get two things. One is to say, we expect you to do the best that you can possibly be and, and be the best you can possibly be and do the best that you can do. Now, you're in charge of giving your best of, the best of yourself. It might not be good enough to win, but you can choose whether you give yourself, you know, do, do the best and be, work the hardest that you can. And for a lot of athletes, as simple as it sounds, all of a sudden it's like, yeah, I can actually. And I am very driven, and I absolutely will give my best. I'm actually feeling pretty good about this now. Okay, I'm in charge now, not somebody else. It's not the outside. I'm in charge now. And, of course, the chimp likes that, so it calms the chimp down. And... Um, and the other thing is that if you can get a, an athlete or a rider on the start line and you ask them the night before, have we left any stone unturned <coughs> in terms of you being ready to take on this challenge? If the answer to that is no, um, we've done everything we possibly can, the chimp won't get involved and you can go working on with the parietal lobe and off you go. If you get to the start line and you go, well, they're on a faster bike, their skin suits are ten times better than ours, he's got a better helmet than I have, we didn't do that training, or we left that bit out, or I did a bit of a shortcut over there, then you're in trouble. You won't, you know, that's where people choke, and that's where people start to underperform, you know, so. Now, I'm thinking about this audience and that plan that you put in place. I mean, there are five things that people, that you've talked about, or other people have talked about, that five key elements. One, everything can be done better. Two, don't let numbers govern everything. Balance statistics with informed observation, which you mentioned. Three, hire the right people and give them space. Four, change takes forever until it happens overnight and five hate to lose and expect to win. Is that a fair summary? Yeah, I think so, yeah. Absolutely. And, and, um, and that would be yeah. very relevant to this audience in terms of their day-to-day -day lives as well, or certainly in the industry. I think, I think if it, it, out of everything that I've done, if I could take a few little bits, the, the, the one thing 
in terms of, I don't know how many people, how many of you manage other people. But if you do manage other people and try and get the best out of other people, um, uh, use a carrot, never use a stick. There's no place for a stick. Nobody likes to be shouted at. Uh, nobody likes to be mistreated and nobody likes to be undermined. And, and if you do, there's probably something wrong with you. And I know a great guy who works with psychopaths, so I'll have a word. But <laughs> in, in the main... Well, what about it, this Australian cricket coach who said to the guys, you know, I, that, come that, up with the presentation? What do you think about that? That, that, that story is quite obviously there is something going on in that team. There's a, that's, and that's just a little bit. That's a, that's a, it's a symptom. That's, that's him flexing that. his muscles. Give yeah, me a presentation. There's, 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 those guys aren't buying into the whole increase in performance. And... and we all sit down, every, every modern sports team sits down and reviews. You know, you plan, you do and review, and it's a continuous circle. Everybody does it, surely everybody does that. And part of the review stage is that actually you, you, you talk and, and work with everybody. You know? So the first thing is, is definitely for me that um, it's all carrot and, and, and as little stick as possible. Um, and if the stick does come out because it's somebody's chimp, then work with it and make sure they understand that and give honest feedback. So. Feedback would be the second thing for me. If you, are, if you are managing people, it's your responsibility to give them good, honest appraisal and help them improve. Um, and I'm sure you'll all have heard of the, the Jahari's window. Mm -hmm. I really, really like that model. And basically it's about what you know about yourself and what other people know about you. So there's, a, you know, there's, all, there's four quadrants, and so there's what other people know about you and what you know about yourself. There's what other people know about you and what you don't know about yourself. And therein lies, for every single one of us, a, an opportunity to improve. The question is, how do you give somebody feedback when it's difficult feedback? And I think if you understand the chimp model, you say, what you don't want to do is prod this person's chimp. We like security. People like structure. We like security. If you're going to undermine somebody or take a, threaten somebody's security, they're not going to listen when you give them feedback. So you've got to think very carefully about how, I, if I was in that person's shoes and I needed to be given this feedback, how would I give it to them? And I think that's very, very, very important. You know? And I think it's our responsibility to tell people and give good feedback in the view of helping them. The feedback in the terms of, I'm giving this to help you, not feedback as an attack on you personally, because I'm going to have a go at you. Just, you, you manage and you're a great believer in teams and building teams of people. And one of the things we see in our industry is that individuals become more successful, they become powerful in all senses of the word, and good people are difficult to manage. Mm. I mean, I think it's true to say that in our industry, and, and as cooperation becomes, you know, team building becomes more important because clients want the best people working on the business. Get people to work together is more. I, I think we find it quite difficult, I certainly do, the better the people, the less cooperative they are. Now, you have teams of stars, Bradley, Chris, mm, or whatever. Mm. How do you manage, particularly as, because people change, people are cyclical, mm. so they don't Absolutely, stay the yeah. same, right? So they, they ebb and flow. How do you manage that? I mean, as they become more successful, they become knights, yeah. they become personalities. They have, you mentioned, you know, Bradley Wiggins has to go and have his dope test and have his press conference. I mean, that puts stresses and strains on people which are very different to what they were used to when they were... I, I think the way to manage that is that if you're... If you're all, all the guys recognise that all the bike riders are equal, but some are more equal than others based on performance. So Bradley, the guys don't mind at all if Bradley has faster wheels on his bike than the helper guys have on their bike. Not a problem. But if Bradley rocks up and we're, we, we wear a certain brand, so we wear Rafa, we race in Rafa clothing. If Bradley turns up in something which is Nike, and nobody says anything because it's Bradley Wiggins and everybody else gets, you know, gets a bollock in if, it's, if, it's, if they turn up with something, then you've got a big problem. So I think that all, you know, that there are certain elements in performance terms that people can, not a problem if, if there's, a, there's a hierarchy, but everything else apart from that. If we're having a team meeting, all the guys are there on time and Bradley turns up 10 minutes late and nobody says anything because it's Bradley Wiggins, we have the beginning of the end of a team. But do they go off the rails? Yeah, of course they do. You know, I think like anybody else, they're human. You know, we're all human. We're all fallible. So how do you bring them back on? Oh, you support them, I think. You really support them and, 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 and give them good feedback. So I think we're not scared of giving good, honest feedback. And uh, we, found, we find ways of trying to give very honest feedback to one another. And then I think the key thing there is, finally is to make sure that the, you have to try and understand what's driving somebody intrinsically. What's their goal? What, does, mm. what, what are they after in, as an individual? I can stand there with a team as much as I want, but if they don't buy and they haven't genuinely bought into, or there's not alignment between the team goal and their goals, it's over. So my job is to understand what, what motivates them 
and work with that to get okay, the best do you out of ever, the team. Have you ever given up on anybody? You said that they got too big yes, headed. Yes, 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 definitely. The, 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 so the, there is a time where you say enough is enough. One hundred percent, and and that's to do with commitment. Nothing okay. to do with talent. So you, you need two things to succeed. One's talent, and one's commitment. But if you don't have, if you've got commitment, not the talent, you can go a long way. Very interesting. But if you've got talent and no commitment, I wouldn't even, not, okay. not for me, thanks very okay. much. Questions, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, so we, can we start here quickly? Time is pressing on. Could you say who you are and where you're from? And then. Hi, I'm Claudine Collins from Mediacom. Um, is it your belief that being so driven is something that you're born with, or do you think it's something that you can instill in someone? Um, I think there's, a, there's an element of, um, again, about what, what, you, what your life is all about, what means what's important to you. Um, and we all tend to, behaviour tends to be driven by perceived reward um, or, or perceived suffering. So we're either avoiding something bad or we're chasing something good, and it's somewhere in the middle. You know, and, and, and that has a, a quite a considerable drive on people. So if we ever want to um, mo change somebody's behaviour or, you know, manipulate their behaviour, manipulate is not a good word, actually, but, you know, change somebody's behaviour, we have a look at this kind of triangle of change, we call it, where suffering and reward has to be great enough to, to make somebody change. And then you need to be, the, you have to be psychologically minded in terms of able to, to know that if you make those changes, you can foresee that. So if you're really, if you're really... Um, um, if you're really having a, you think you're having a tough time, or you're not, you know, you're not, you're not towing the, towing the line, let's say in Bradley's case, for example, you know, and he can, can, he can be a difficult character, and if he can, continues to do that, then it comes a certain point in time where he's rewarded very, very well, so that's not having any, any impact anymore. So actually, you've got, you've got to manipulate the suffering bit. So that's where, they, it's, and this isn't, a, this isn't a stick, it's not, you know, it's just, right, okay, here's some consequences to your behaviour. And you increase the consequences to the point where you know that actually the consequence now is, is tipped in his mind enough to actually change his behaviour. But whether, I, I'm sure everybody's driven about different things. So the, the challenge is everybody in life is driven about something. It's actually are you driven about the thing that you're meant to be driven about is the challenge. And I think if you're not, then I think whoever, whoever it is has to recognise, right, I'm actually not that interested in this, I'm not driven towards this. But I can do it because the reward at the end is money for a lot of people, which is why they go to work, or satisfaction, or recognition, or one of those other things. So I wouldn't say everybody definitely is driven to what they're aligned to do in life. Um, and if they are in that situation, they should change, would be my take on it. OK, next. Hi, Greg Grimmer from HMDG. Um, probably a question for both of you, actually. I think Martin's had it a bit too easy. but. Uh, it's been very difficult uh, for people to move from sport. So Clive Woodward being an example. Yeah, so Dave, if, if cycling is banned from the Olympics, which we hope it isn't, um, which sport would you do? And Sir Martin, which Fortune 500 company would you work for outside of the sector? <laughs> mm. um, outside of cycling, um, I think football would be something that I would look at. Only in so far as I think there's a lot of, you, you know, there's the, there's the, the cliche. Do you think Alec Ferguson's uh, um, traits, characteristics are similar to your own? <laughs> I, think, um, I, think, I think his drive and his, uh, his ability to manage people. I think what you see on the outside and what you actually see, you know, I've met, met him and talked about quite a lot of stuff. And, um, no, I, I think his... His, his knack has been to retain control and total control of that club and what goes on in that club for such an extended period of time. You never hear about conflict between Alex Fergus and Man United as you do in most of the clubs between the manager and the board or the owners at some times. And he, he knows that he, you know, his power lies in his control. But he, he's got that knack of being the fantastic supporter of an individual, but also the consequences and you know, putting the, the consequences down. And what about Guardiola be. and Mourinho? Yeah, yeah, different, different yeah, styles. Yeah? Different styles, different styles. Mourinho, um, I, I like a lot. You know, very, very different. But he's from, not. He he's, he's doesn't strike me as being the Brailsford type. No, different I was just going to say, a very, very different type yeah. of person. You know, and I think um, a lot of flair, a lot of charisma, um, brilliant leader. Uh, but you know, something that I could never be. I, I just don't. Have Guardiola that. is more your. Uh, your possibly, type. yeah. Possibly, but uh, again, a very, very 
very good. Uh, the, the, one of the guys I really admire in football is David Moyes, actually. I think he does a fantastic job in what is, you know, a, a, a medium, if not sort of lower kind of resourced club. I think he does an unbelievably good job. Anybody else in other sports that you admire? Yeah, a lot. I, um, I like, um, obviously, Billy Bean. I think what he did and it's well fantastic. documented, documented fantastic. now, that was, that was a, a real breakthrough. Um, I like quite a lot of the guy. There's a guy working in Formula One from McLaren called Jeff McGrath. I think he's, um, he's an outstanding guy. You know, and, uh, yes, there are various. Okay. Um, I'm not going to answer questions. This is not for me. It's for somebody else. Over here. Can we quickly here? And then we go there. Sorry to... We need a... Not oh, right yeah. here. Just coming to your right, sir. Just there we go. And then one, this lady here. <laughs> Give her a mic, please. Tim Ashton, Antidote. Um, this session's called Winning. And uh, you've been doing a hell of a lot of that in the last uh, couple of years with Team Sky. And I guess, predictably, uh, some of the press and some of the other teams have been saying that there's a predictability to this, your style and the way you ride. And I wondered what you felt about um, your team and your athletes having sort of panache, but not necessarily winning, Ian Stannard yesterday, for example, and how important that is to be um, sort of the hard and the soft, I guess. That was the snow. Yesterday. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah it's, um, it's an interesting thing, I think, um, what we recognise. that the, the sport of cycling has gone through a big change, obviously, and in the last, last four, five, six years, um, it's not reliant on doping. And for the last 20 years, you know, the way to go faster on a bike was uh, the, the core competence, if you like, of, of professional cycling was pharmacology and evading detection and logistics of moving, you know, uh, doping products around the world uh, undetected. And, um, and, that, and they were bloody good at it, let me tell you. Um, but that stopped and, and, and we came along at the time. My background's in, in coaching and genuinely trying to, to perform through, through coaching the human mind. So we came into the sport and it's a good time really because all of the core competence of the other teams was based on, you know, on these areas. And of course, they'd never even bothered thinking about how to get somebody to go fast without uh, doping products, which gave us a great window of opportunity to walk in and start winning which was part of our Tour de France thing, but I didn't think I could say that really, but there we go. Let's, I mean, but e every, everybody's amazed by what happened around the Lance Armstrong, which I want to come back to if we get a chance before then, but it, was this institutionalised corruption? Yeah. Simple yeah. as that. Well, I don't think you, you'd be lying if you said, you know, when, when people, when there's people organising um, doping, as they did at the time. I think it's a bit like, to me, I mean, I don't think they're necessarily bad people as such. I think what happened was, I think it's a, uh, similar to, you know, somebody having their first joint, as it were, and then, you know, you go from that on to whatever the next step is, maybe ecstasy, and then on to, before you know it, everybody's on crack cocaine. And, um, and I think that's what happened to professional cycling, because they're all of a sudden, it's, all, it's a very, it's 95% physical sport of cycling. And along came a drug called EPO, which made a massive difference to your performance, but wasn't detectable. And so you had a team doctor going, you know what, you know, if you took that, you're not going to get caught. You will go a lot faster. And the rewards, we're talking millions and millions of pounds. And of course, a lot of people said, yeah, OK, well. But you can achieve the same results with EPO with high altitude training, is that right? Uh, no. Well, you can, you can, the, the, the impact, what it does to physically, what it does to, um, to our blood and, and, and the, some of the parameters, physical parameters, it's a similar type of effect, if you like, as uh, training at, uh, at altitude. Altitude. But the performance enhancement through uh, the use of EPO um, was, was quite significant. Okay. Mm. Lady there. We'll get the chance, because I'm going to talk about that. Uh, Sharon Bailey from Indigo Blue. Um, so Lance Armstrong was where I was going with the question. His argument, as we probably all saw, lots of people saw on opera, was, yeah, I was winning, but I was winning in a level playing field that looked like this, as you've just described it, a playing field where everybody was doing it, and if you wanted to win, that was kind of your ticket to entry. And then beyond that, your own personal performance, capabilities, training, etc., still came into play. Somebody had to win. They had to be better than the next guy. Mm. If they were all doping, then that's how, that's how his argument goes, pretty much. And then he has his comeback and doesn't win the tour. Still places very highly, clean, allegedly. Um, my question is, would the sport of cycling or will the sport of cycling be um, a lesser one for it without the individual that is the um, reformed Lance Armstrong in it, 
because of the potential experience he's got to bring to bear? And, um, and do you think he can, um, he can rehabilitate himself? Anybody, I think you can re rehabilitate yourself, and I think that's down to the individual. And I think that the likes of David Miller, for example, I think has done a good job at that. Uh, of that, you know, but um, didn't it go like too far with him? I mean, with suing, uh, suing journalists. Who's yeah, I, th I think it's the way he went about the way he, the, him as a person. I think you know when you start suing people, and, 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 and the word bullying is often used, and you know, I think that was just unpleasant, <laughs> and um, I don't think there's any need for it really. You know, I, I, I took quite a, a strong stance and controversial stance in all of this, where at Team Sky we introduced a zero tolerance policy. So we, we, we decided that in our recruitment we wouldn't recruit anybody um, who'd had any kind of doping infringement in the past. Um, and then we, we changed that. As, as all this stuff started coming out, we actually changed it to anybody who's had active involvement in doping in the past, which wipes out a big sector of the uh, potential workforce um, for, for myself and, um, and it's quite interesting the reaction there's been to that some people have, uh, have said yep yeah, that's a good strong solid stance very sensible you know start off with you know the clean riders who have never been involved in doping this is something that happened in the past we've got a lot of young riders now come up in a totally different system um, and then have staff around them who've never been involved as well the challenge I think is when um, the particular challenge I think is around if you, if you take each individual, and you, we always break them down to knowledge, skills and behaviours, and the ex-player in sport is, is there mainly because of the knowledge. So I've been there, I've seen it, I've got the experience of risk tactic, or I've, you know, I've been an ex-player, you can't see what I can see, and all that kind of stuff. That's all the knowledge side of it, and that's why a lot of these guys get employed. But they're relatively low on skills, and the behaviour, it's individually kind of, you know, are, are they um, trustworthy or not trustworthy, do they have integrity, etc. I think the, so for us, the sports directors, the guys who call the tactics, as it were, they're nearly always ex-professional cyclists. And if you want an ex-professional cyclist now, over the age of 30, 35, it's, it's nearly impossible to find one. So I have to make the decision of, do we actually take a step back in performance, potentially, by having inexperienced, uh, inexperienced tacticians on the team, um, or do we actually try and change this policy that we had and said, actually, you know what, maybe it's a bit too harsh, everybody deserves a second chance and we should have a, you know, we should employ anybody who's had, I don't know, a year's ban, whatever. But we actually decided, no, we're going stick to with, stick with our zero tolerance policy. And, and it's quite interesting that it's, it's you know, it, I, I think to, opinion is very, very divided on it. And it certainly, we, it doesn't make us very favoured by many people. I think people see it quite draconian. Um, but I'm pretty clear in my mind that um, I got into this in, in the professional side of cycling, you know, with my eyes wide open, and I wanted to do it so that the young guys in Britain who were coming up through our academy and our Olympic program could go into a team where they would never, ever, ever have to face uh, the a question or be asked or but you did suggested employ, to You did don't. employ that doctor for a couple of weeks, didn't you? Yeah, completely, yeah, and absolutely made a massive, massive error there, which just shows you how difficult it is. And, and what happened there was that... Um, we, we, we decided to start out, we, we said we're going to employ doctors who are uh, British doctors who've never been involved in a sport of cycling. Um, so we did that. And then we were, we were off we went racing on our first season. Our first season was very, very difficult and we got a lot of things wrong and we learned a lot of lessons. And we were racing in the, in the Tour of Spain and um, all the team uh, fell ill and um, a member of staff fell very, very ill as well. And we just didn't know what was going on. They were racing 40 degrees. They were, they were, it, was, it was a real epic kind of situation. And uh, to cut a long story short, we, the, one of the carers, we left him in a hotel. We went on to the next hotel. Three days later, he died. This was, a, this was like a 40-year-old guy. He died. And that, that was a shocking experience. We all stopped the race. We came out of the race, went to his funeral with his family. It was horrific. And what we recognised there and then, we did not have... It wasn't, it, wasn't a, it wasn't the doctor's fault, don't get me wrong, but this guy went to hospital, was admitted to hospital three times and released, went back to hospital and he was released and went back to hospital and died. He had septicemia. And it wasn't picked up. And that, I can assure you, that is a horrific experience to be involved with. And what I then decided was actually, we, we haven't got enough experience here. So we, need, we need some guys in this team with more experience. So we, we, did, we did the rounds. This guy was recommended to us. The Belgian by, guy. Yeah, yeah. By, by somebody in our team who we thought at the time was trustworthy. He came in, sent him up to Steve Peters, who's a psychiatrist. He's the, he's the head of our medical team. He sat down with Steve, and Steve grilled him um, and actually said, no, actually, as far as I can see, this guy's okay. 
he came on board and then lo and behold something came out about his past um, in, in the early 2000s where he was working with another team and he'd been involved with doping there. So of course we released him straight away but it flies in the face of our zero tolerance okay. and, and you know what could we have done differently? I think our, our recruitment process could have been more rigorous um, but it just goes to show if somebody says, sits you and looks you in the eye and said, no, yeah, I, I, I'm not, not been involved in doping, never going to be, da 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 it's difficult to okay. prove otherwise. You know? Can we carry on or not? Okay, so okay. anybody's got any questions, you send me an email, msorrell at wpp.com. I send it to Dave, and if he gets any time in between <laughs> events that he's involved in, I'm sure he'll answer it. One final, final question. Now, this is about winning, as somebody reminded us. What tip would you give us? What is the most important thing so that everybody in this room can be a winner? What is the <coughs> if you If you want to win, you need clarity. If you do not have clarity of the people, if you work with people, and if you've got a vision, you should have a, you have a vision that means something to you. If you haven't, and you just think it's a waste of time, those day away days and the half days writing on the piece of paper, sticking them on the wall, put it all, go home, forget about it, you haven't got a vision, um, and you need a vision to believe in. You then you need three or four kind of your key priorities that are going to achieve your vision. And you, as the, if you're leaders or your managers, you then communicate that on a regular basis in your dialogue on a day to day basis. And your chimps and your team's chimps will want security, they will want clarity over role and responsibility, and absolute clarity over role and responsibility, and they will want to be told on a regular basis that they're doing a good job. And if you can do that right, and so your jobs, if you like, if you think of yourselves as ambassadors of clarity. Go and ask, get your team together tomorrow, sit in a room, do something very, very simple. Ask them to tell you what the vision of your whatever it is you do. Can you tell me that you there, what your vision is, please? And uh, let's see if they all can. And then ask them for the three or four most important things that's going to achieve that vision <laughs> and tell them what they're doing, how they're going to, you know, just that type of dialogue and see for yourself how much clarity there is. And get them to write the roles and responsibilities. Where does one person's job stop and the next one start? And if they can do that meticulously, and that's an easy thing to do, if you can do that or if you can make that happen, you will go a long, long, much, much further than most of your competitors towards winning. So Prime Minister Cameron and Chancellor George Osborne, <laughs> please note. Thank you very much, David. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.